I'm Terry Speed and uh, up until very recently I used to be head of bioinformatics at the Walter Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research but I have passed that role on to someone else very recently. I see bioinformatics as the application of mathematics, statistics, computing methods to molecular data. Uh, in the recent years there's been an enormous explosion of molecular data and you need special tools, special insights, special algorithms to get the knowledge out of it. You know, typically it's generated by machines, so we need to do a lot of initial processing and then fine-tuned processing so that we get, if you like, knowledge from data. Uh, and But the data is always molecular, and this is what's new because it, it builds on insights going back to the 1950s, the, the nature of the DNA molecule. Bioinformatics per se is about doing things with the data, but behind that is an enormous body of technology for generating the data. And I think if you look at biology over the last 50 years, say, or a little bit longer since DNA, the structure of DNA was discovered, the technologies, the biotechnologies, the physics, the electrical engineering that was brought to bear to generate biological data, and it's just developed amazingly over this period to the, sen to the point now where we're Really, I think we're almost, it's very dangerous to say we're at the ultimate, but in some sense, when you can get the DNA of all organisms, there's not a lot more you could ask for. I mean, of course, that saying that, there will always be people that will ask for more, but we're right down at the basics now. Every, every organism on the planet involves DNA in some way or other, so that every biological science now is involving data about DNA, whether you're studying worms or insects or bacteria or birds or animals or diseases, DNA is at the core of it. And uh, we now have the technologies to take the DNA, work out its sequence, and then analyze the data. So that's another sort of convergence, is a convergence of technologies that will collect the data and the biology that can use, can stimulate the need for that data and interpret it, and the bioinformatics, which in some sense interfaces the two. We can take the data off the machines, we can sort of put it in a form while we interact with the biologists so that they learn from it. And the, the range of things that we can learn, it's just, it's just amazing. Basic science, you know, whether you're doing ecology or evolution or whether you're doing uh, diagnostics or whether you're trying to cure cancer or trying to understand cancer, whether you're trying to learn about the workings of cells or the ways in which birds migrate, all of these things, just quite incredible. The, it's a sort of, uh, in, in my to my mind, it's the sort of creativity of human mind that they can actually see ways to utilize these technologies to illuminate different aspects of the life sciences. So it's technology, it's life science, and then from my side, it is interpreting the data, dealing with the data, analyzing it, processing it, storing it, retrieving it, and it's just in exponentially growing quantities. So we never lose challenges, because you solve a problem this year, in three years' time, you'll be looking at the same problem with a thousand times the amount of data, and your old solution may be inappropriate. Or there'll be totally new problems, so inexhaustible source of problems, ever-changing background, which means we never run out of ideas, never run out of challenges. Obviously, we need the analytical skills, if you think of it, the sort of, we need to understand the mathematics, the statistics, the computing algorithms. We also need to know about how to manage data. But, of course, data is just sort of, if you like, symbols or, or numbers. Mm. To make sense of them, you've got to be able to get your head around the questions that the biologists are trying to understand. It's not as simple as saying, take an average, work out a standard deviation. You know, we're, we're trying to dig into the data, and that really means we have to get ourselves into the biology. So there's no one in this institute, or at least in our group doing bioinformatics, who isn't, to, to some extent, also a bit of a biologist. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're not professional biologists, but there's no limit you can't say, this is the amount of biology you need and now you're fine. It, the more biology you understand, the better job you can do with the data analysis. And, and that, that just continues as well. So although I've been doing it for perhaps 40 or 50 years, 
I'm way behind the top biologists here and every little inch I progress towards them, the better I can play my role as a bioinformatician. Take one example would be cancer stem cells. There's, there was a group in the institute, a group of medical researchers, biological medical researchers who have identified a category of breast cancer stem cells. So you can imagine the cancer grows and if you kill almost all of it but you don't kill the stem cell with your treatment, it'll regenerate because the stem cell has the, and there might be very, very few of these. So somehow killing almost every cell in your tumour is not good enough. So these people were studying stem cells for several years and of course we're interested in the molecular characteristics of the stem cells which involves generating data on the stem cells and then trying to understand what it is that makes a stem cell from a molecular perspective and that involves comparing the stem cell the internal workings of the stem cell we will we'll call it the gene expression profile to other cells that are better understood and that was a bioinformatic task that one of my colleagues, Professor Gordon Smythe, uh, rose to the challenge and found ways of looking at the stem cells and comparing them to other categories of cells. So it's almost like saying, you know, here's, here's a, a novel cell. Which of the more traditional cells is it most similar to? And, uh, well, this, this was not a totally straightforward problem, but he found a very good solution and they got a very satisfactory insight into the stem cell. Something quite analogous, but in a very, very different context, was understanding the nature of the tumour that affects the Tasmanian devil. I think people probably know that Tasmanian devils are being stricken with a very ugly facial tumour, which is ultimately fatal. And uh, you can extract these tumour cells, and you can ask, what cell type are they? And again, it's a similar sort of problem. You can look at the genes in the cells, and find out what, whether they, you know, which part of the body contributed to this facial tumour because tumour cells invariably migrate to other places so that they carry some sort of signature of where they came from. And a very, very effective identification that it turned out that they were particular sorts of brain cells, neural cells that were actually in the facial tumour. And this helped understand, didn't, hasn't actually, they haven't actually solved the problem of stopping the epidemic of the uh, Tasmanian facial tumour be it, but it, it threw light on it. So that would be, if you like, identification of types of cells. A very different problem would be find the gene that causes the trait. You know, we, we have a number of questions, say for example, a particular family finds they have a number of children with some unusual disease, and it's thought because it's in a family it should be genetic. What is the cause of it? What is the genetic cause? What is the defect. The genome is a very big place. We can sequence the genome, but there's still an enormous amount of data to go through and find those very specific, often of just a single base change that is actually the cause of this disease. So we have one of my colleagues here, Associate Professor Melanie Barlow, very active in doing this thing which we call disease gene mapping. And uh, that technology has evolved quite rapidly in recent years because we can get all the sequence data on members of the family. So she's had some stunning successes. In fact, the Prime Minister's Science Prize this year was awarded to two people that study epilepsy. And Melanie works very closely with them because they map epilepsy genes and they do the biology. Melanie works with them to do the bioinformatics of analyzing the data that pinpoints the gene. So uh, they're very different. And we have, we have, of course, a wide variety of things, but that's two examples. So I guess uh, one view of the future of bioinformatics is that it will disappear because it will become part of mainstream biology. You know, if you think that as time goes on, biologists are not going to be divorced from computers, from mathematics, from statistics, they're going to have to learn it. And so we'll no longer be a specialised subdiscipline because every biologist is going to have the elements of bioinformatics in their training. I mean, it doesn't mean that there won't be a role for, if you like, advanced specialists, but that the broad goals, the broad tasks of our discipline at the moment could just get absorbed. So that when you say biology, you mean, oh, the ability to not only do stuff in the lab, but to do stuff in the computer. That's a very plausible future, I think, 50 years down the line. But in the near term, it is definitely going to stay separate because 
as you, uh, as you would imagine, the data is still exploding and we still need specialists. But I think somehow the growth of the specialists is going to be sort of caught up by the expansion of, if you like, interdisciplinary biologists who, uh, and of course they exist right now, but uh, there's a question of how quickly it's going to diffuse right through the whole discipline. But I, I, I think that's a plausible future, but I'll be long dead, so I won't be around to be proved wrong. I think in the, in the short term, in some sense, my job is secure, but in the long term, I won't be sorry to see it go. Well, I think back when I was a school student, there was a bit of a sense that if you were good at maths, you went in the physical and mathematical sciences path. And if you're interested in science, but you weren't good at maths, you'd do biology or geology or something like that. And they were two very different styles of science. But in the 50 years since then, maths has become an important part of not just physics, of course, but of biology, statistics, computing. So that in that sense, uh, these paths have conversed. And I think in the future, that'll have an impact on the specialist people. Right now, I'm seen as interdisciplinary. But I think in the future, the actual disciplines will become interdisciplinary. And in which case, you know, you'll no longer have specialists, you'll have people with strengths in some areas and others, but that it's not like we will have the sort of sacred task to preserve our special skills because they'll be widely diffused. And because I think they're, they're already appreciated, it's just that people's training and upbringing and you know, in, in some sense, some of them, the attitudes, they will change in time, they are changing.